when people for the first time see data that tells them about all these other dimensions of their lives and how they are ranking or how, what their relative weights are, it, it raises awareness. It, it starts dis public discussions about should we be thinking about these aspects of quality of life? Should we be thinking about how much our community matters or how much our health matters? This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, the economics of happiness. Could knowing what makes people happy result in better policy and political decisions? Many economists say perhaps so. Increasingly, researchers are studying well-being to gain a more comprehensive understanding of issues that affect the way we live. It's an idea whose time has come, notes senior fellow Carol Graham as she explains the economics of happiness. Well-being metrics, or happiness economics, tells us what? We're trying to, to complement what standard economic tools measure, which is based on income measures um, and how much people earn, how much they consume, with being able to attach relative weights to, for example, the welfare effects of commuting time, of losing a job, of being sick, of being divorced, or the positive effects of having friendships or family, or the positive effects of doing meaningful work. We're actually able to measure all these things and attach relative weights to them, we can look at how much these things matter to people's lives and how much changes in these things matter. Um, how much does a loss of a job matter? How much does a long-term spell of unemployment matter compared to a short-term one? And uh, we're able to track how, these, how people are doing along these lines, how people compare to each other, and how people compare over time. How is happiness defined and what, does it, what role does it play in policy making? When you start thinking about national well-being indicators or should happiness be a policy objective, then the definition becomes critical. And I think here you find, um, or you would find, as I have looking at this worldwide, that different societies may emphasize different elements of happiness or well-being depending on their culture, depending on people's capabilities. For example, People uh, mispredict what will make them happy, and they buy big houses way outside the city. And it turns out when we use well-being metrics, we find that commuting time is the least happy time of the day. Again, it doesn't mean you should you would dictate where people should put their houses, but that's information that's very relevant to policy, very relevant to transportation policy. Uh, another example comes from um, a sort of behavioral kinds of choices that people make where again they they either mispredict or the choices aren't optimal choices. Standard economics would assume that a choice is a rational choice and therefore people are enhancing their welfare. But with happiness metrics we find that cigarette taxes make smokers happier, that um, the obese are less happy than the non-obese, which assumes that then their consumption choices are not making them happy. Um, all kinds of other um, things like that where we can see that people's choices may not be making them happy or better off. They may be making choices for all kinds of other reasons and that will have big implications for how we think about things. Well, okay, if we measure happiness, does it matter what makes people unhappy? Change makes people very unhappy and the kinds of dramatic change that is required, for example, as countries develop, um, as countries have very rapid economic growth in the case of countries like Brazil or China, those changes come with things, are associated with things that make people unhappy, like rising levels of inequality, rising levels of insecurity. Things are changing. People who used to be middle class aren't middle class anymore. Those periods of change make people extremely unhappy, and yet we know that progress and change is necessary to achieve sort of the, all of the other things that we know make people happier in the broader sense. Things like political freedom, higher levels of income matter because they come with things like better public goods and all sorts of other things. And so when you try and move a, a poorer society to a wealthier society, that, that, that process um, can be very unsettling and produce a lot of unhappiness in the short term. The Declaration of Independence, Carol, talks about the pursuit of happiness. Are you talking about the same thing that the Founding Fathers are talking about? I think if you go back to the Founding Fathers, 
the pursuit of happiness is quite different from guaranteeing happiness. And the U.S. is a society that's very much based on opportunities. We seem to be very comfortable trying to guarantee equal opportunity. We have no interest, as far as I can tell, in guaranteeing equality of outcomes. To guarantee people the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of a meaningful life means that you also need to guarantee your citizens agency. You need to guarantee them the capacity to, to make those pursuits. And that, I think, poses a big challenge for our public policy because our opportunities are not equally distributed at the moment. Can this kind of information be skewed or abused or used to mislead people? Like anything else that gets into the political domain, information can be misused. And we find, for example, as I mentioned, that in poor countries or in people, people who are disadvantaged or may report to be very happy in the contentment sense, in the day-to-day -day sense, because that's all they're able to do, and so they're making the best of a bad situation. That's a wonderful individual human capacity. But if you think about that collectively, and a bad policymaker who uses that information in the wrong way, you could conclude, well, let's keep people poor, ignorant, and happy in that simple contentment sense. And there are other ways one could imagine that these data could be misused by nefarious you know, a nefarious politician, particularly in a country where political rights were limited. Um, but even in a country where, like ours, where the political debate is so divided, you can imagine that the metrics could be misconstrued. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your Blackberry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu slash mobile.